Hello everyone, today we'll be traveling back to the early 60s once more and we're seeing the lives the Beatles had at this time through the eyes of their manager Brian Epstein. In this case, uh, we're looking at Brian's business side of things and this will be the final uh, video about that. We come, we're coming to the end of his book, but it's been very interesting and I liked how we've seen the Beatles through his eyes. So let's get up to it and see what's going on next. Under his business, NEMS, it was formed in Liverpool in 1962. Brian said that the money coming into the company was sufficient enough to be rewarded for the work that they do. And he said the Beatles were great stars and received the sort of money great stars are accustomed to receiving. NEMS was formed to handle the affairs of Brian's artist, and it was an offshoot of the family business. He used the name of the family business, North End Music Stores, because he didn't want to personalize it by calling it Brian Epstein Organization. Brian said he first separated the Beatles as a private business, and he handled it all alone. He collected the cash at the end of the week, and he was grateful when it reached 100 pounds. Things started to grow, and Brian had Jerry and the pacemakers, and he formed a limited company to cope with tax matters, and it was to keep the groups and the artists on proper footing. Clive joined as a director and Brian registered NEMS Enterprises LTD in June of 1962. Brian's brother, though, was busy working with the family business, so Brian needed to hire a staff to help him out. And Brian needed a personal assistant to deal with the smaller issues. Brian was free then to concentrate on the promotion and the welfare of the artists he had. Pretty soon, Brian and his company outgrew Liverpool, and Brian was sad about that. He had to open an office in London, and they got an office next door to the London Palladium in Argyle Street. Brian said the money came in from all sides, personal appearances, from records, from television, radio, and film work, and merchandising. Uh, there was every product under the sun there. The sheet music side of the business and the publishing side of the business, John Paul and Brian had linked up with Dick James. He was a well-regarded publisher. And to handle the songs of John and Paul, the two composer Beatles, Norwegian songs, LTD was formed with Dick. In the middle of all the mania, Brian Epstein started to feel the strain. He said the traveling, the telephone, the talk, the deals, the relentless social duties, a feeling of having to be somewhere else but home all the time, and the hard work of trying to stay on top got to be too much at one point. And then he thought, I have the power to do something about it. And an interviewer asked him if he would ever consider selling the Beatles, and Brian didn't answer him at first. Then he said, I don't think I would. And the journalist said, look me in the eyes and say, I'll never sell the Beatles. Brian looked away and he didn't answer. He said he felt awful. Six months before, if he had been asked the question, he would never have considered it. As the sole director of all his artists, or he could have cash in hand, 150,000 pounds, for a share in the Beatles. And three days later, he met up with the man. Brian said the offer was for a 50% interest in all of Brian's artists and management companies, and he would get a capital gain of 150,000 pounds, and Brian would be allowed to have a final say on the type of work the Beatles did and relieve the strain, but Brian's power would be limited. Brian didn't really care for that, but it would ease the pressure he felt in the worry. Brian said to the man, I need time, and he said he needed to tell the Beatles. Brian, in his mind, had thought he would sell the Beatles and all his artists except for one, and that they would be under his direction only. The other artists, he would be a personal manager, and the agency that was in on the deal would take over the headaches and get a great deal of the income. Brian had the Beatles show up in his flat, and he told them what he was thinking. And George was the first to speak, and he said, You're joking. And Brian said he'd never been more serious in his life. And Ringo said, Tell us again. And Brian said it over again and asked, How do you feel? It's a very good agency. John got upset and said, Get stuffed. And Paul was mad, too, and said something less polite. Brian then said, You don't seem very enthusiastic. Blame the Beatles for feeling that way. Brian had asked, to be their manager to take care of them, and now he was trying to only be around half the time. Brian said that they looked at him like he was crazy, and Brian said to them, You must know this. I'm not sure I can do everything I should for you, 
the organization's getting very big and the pressure is a bit much. You might well be better off elsewhere. The Beatles didn't know what to say. They didn't ever think that there would be a split in their relationship. Brian tried to tell them it would be in their best interest, but the longer he spoke, the less he believed in himself. And Brian said, well, and Paul said, sell us and we'll pack up completely. We'll throw the whole lot up tomorrow. Brian said it was all that he needed, and he was overwhelmed by their attitude. Brian said their loyalty was tremendous, and he felt he could never repay it. Brian said at that moment he hadn't realized the depth of how proud the Beatles were of him as their leader. Brian went back to the man who made the offer and said, Thank you for your offer, but I cannot accept it. I don't think all the money in the world would be enough. The man was very disappointed, and he said to Brian, Okay, Brian, fair enough. It would have been a good deal, though. Yeah, I'm sure he thought so, because he wanted to get in on a portion of the Beatles' profits. <laughs> Brian thought that this was the point. The Beatles weren't a deal. They were unique human beings, and he thought of them if the whole thing ended. He would always be with the Beatles. He wanted to look after them all their lives, not for a percentage, but because they were his friends. Brian said he never wavered in his determination to retain sole direction, because he couldn't be sure that anyone else would care for the artists in the way they deserved. He felt they needed him in all modesty. Brian said he still felt the strain, but he knew that thousands of executives had that feeling, and Brian felt that he didn't know anyone who worked harder than he did. Brian said he wasn't boastful, but it was true. The telephone in his office, there were two of them, one a direct line and the other through a switchboard, didn't stop for one second of any day. He said there were two calls on simultaneously in the inner office dictaphone, and he had a good staff. And Brian said he wasn't very good at delegating. Brian thought he had the people who make wise and honorable decisions, but he was hesitant to give them the power to do so. He felt by him making his own mind, he was sure things would be going in the vision he had in mind. Brian said he believed in democracy, but he liked one man in charge and have him answer to his own mistakes. Brian said he felt loneliness because when a record went bad or a business venture failed, Brian felt he suffered most because he held himself responsible. Brian said it wasn't the money that worried him, but the failure. Brian felt found fame being a Beatle manager. He didn't seek it, but it came to him. People wanted to interview him. Fans mobbed him, and he was asked for his autograph. Ringo told him that's the penalty of being a Beatles manager. But being a Beatle had its rules, too. A Beatle could not marry. It would be okay if they were married before joining the band, but not if they were in the band. A Beatle can't go into the local cinema or get a quick pint at the local, because if he does, he will spend the whole evening signing autographs, and he might also be insulted. A Beatle can't go abroad for a holiday with his girlfriend, for if he does, someone in the press will mention it, not being a moral example, even though every teenager in the land goes on vacation with a member of the opposite sex, Brian said. <laughs> so the last chapter was called Tomorrow, and that was the last chapter in the cellar full of noise, and he was talking about the future. Brian started out by saying, whatever happens tomorrow, one thing is certain, it must not be allowed to look after itself, for tomorrow is a cardinal problem, and it must be tightly under my control. He said it was a great pleasure to keep the Beatles, Billy J, and Scylla comfortable. Brian felt he couldn't relax because taking care of his artists was more important. Brian said people would ask, how long will the Beatles last? Some, he said, felt they were just a craze. Brian said he didn't know how long the Beatles would last, and they didn't either. Brian felt that things looked promising. They were the biggest attraction the entertainment industry had ever known. He felt that that kind of bigness didn't dissolve overnight or even in a year. Brian felt that the future of the Beatles depended on the Beatles and on him. He, he was sure right about that. George Harrison wrote in his Daily Express column, We obviously can't go around as Beatles when we're in our 40s, but that's kind of laughable today because of all the acts that are still performing in their way past 40. <laughs> well, Brian felt that they're was a good possibilities in film, and that's the direction he wanted them to go into. Brian knew they couldn't keep touring the country on one-night performances, living out of their suitcases year after year, and doing a record every three months. The Beatles liked to do personal appearances, Brian said. Brian said he wasn't their keeper, he was their manager. 
He wasn't a parent with a duty to teach them manners or how to speak or hold their forks. And he wasn't a schoolmaster to make them read or to cultivate themselves. He wasn't a judge on their morals or behavior. He said he was just a guide. He said he tried to ease them into doing a song in this order or that order and hint at a style of suit that might be right for them. He said he had learned from them and they had learned from him. Brian said he enjoyed the show business and he liked artists and all artists. He liked being around them. He enjoyed their conversation and he got satisfaction from developing new artists. Brian mentioned when Paul started going out with Jane Asher, the press found out and then there were rumors of marriage. He said Jane and Paul knew it was unwise for pop singers to marry, and so they stayed single. But if they were determined to wed, there was nothing that Brian could do, and he didn't wish to stop them. He said that all the Beatles there would be married in time, and then Brian said, if I can get two days off, so may I. He felt the organization was strong enough to endure the changes. Brian said that he could be hugely rich, but he didn't know what good it would do him. He said, I live well and spend largely and buy things I like, but I always did. And if I stopped earning tomorrow, I could easily decimate my standard of living and still have a wonderful life. He liked uh, whining and dining in fancy restaurants, but he would be happier in a small country restaurant. He preferred spending quiet time with George Martin and his wife, Judy, going to the Lingfield Park races. And much more than money he could buy, Brian said he loved to lean on his elbows at the back of the stalls and watch the curtain rise on John, Paul, George, and Ringo and his other artists. And he ended on a positive note saying, I think the sun will shine tomorrow. The ending of the book found Brian looking forward to tomorrow and all that he did as a manager. He found stress and strain in handling all the acts, but he wanted to be the one to make the decision for the Beatles and his other acts. They were more performers kept... They were more than performers to Brian. They were his friends, too, and family. If Brian had lived, the Beatles probably would have gone on for a much longer time. When he passed away, they lost their way. He had done so much for them to keep them happy, and not having to deal with the business matters, they got to concentrate on their music, and that was more important to them. I have liked looking at Brian's point of view, and we got to see what happened when he discovered the Beatles and the surprise for both him and the Beatles when Beatlemania began in England and spread throughout the world. Thank God for Brian Epstein because he guided them into stardom. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated. I wish everyone a good day, and tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. Thank you. Bye.